Hello, my name is Lucy Applin from the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behaviour and today I'd like to talk to you about social learning, culture and cultural evolution in birds. When you think of animal culture you might be more inclined to envision large brain primates or whales, but actually we see examples of social learning, cultural inheritance and culture in birds across multiple behavioural domains. Importantly, research in birds has been instrumental in providing experimental evidence for the ontogeny and neurobiology of social learning and for the social processes underlying the spread of behaviour in populations. Finally, some of the best examples of the spread of innovation occur in birds, often in the context of adaptation to human modified environments. And I'll talk about that at the end of the lecture. However, it's important to note that when we talk about social learning in birds, birds are not a homogenous mass. Uh, we have almost 10,000 species of birds, which vary greatly in their evolutionary history, their life history trajectories, and their cognition from relatively small brain ratites like uh, emus, through to uh, birds like parrots and corvids, which are sometimes called feathered apes for their complex cognitive ability. Focal learning also varies across bird species, from those species that appear to have relatively fixed vocalizations, to those taxa like passerines, um, those songbirds that you see in your garden if you live in Europe or North America. And in these species, vocal learning appears to be mostly restricted to early life. To attacks are like parrots, which learn throughout their lives and are known for their amazing imitative abilities. So these differences will all have implications for the evolution of social learning and culture. However, one important factor to note is that almost all birds are social, from species that aggregate in large flocks, like these corellas that I'm showing in the top picture here, to those that form stable cooperative family groups like these pied babblers down here. So there's ample opportunity for social learning to occur and to be adaptive in many different ecological contexts. So this is a lecture of four parts. In the first part, I'll talk briefly about the ecological context in which we observe social learning in birds and then give some specific examples for a couple of these contexts. I'll then talk about cultural inheritance and the vertical transmission of behavior from previous generations to the next and highlight the importance of experimental work in birds for our understanding of these processes. In the third section, I'll discuss the evidence for naturally occurring cultural variation in wild bird populations. And then finally, I'll look at what happen when, happens when the environment changes and explore the spread of innovation and cultural change, which we sometimes call cultural evolution. But first, what context do we have for social learning in birds? Well, actually, uh, lots. <laughs> um, social learning appears to be widespread in many species and influences a diversity of behaviour, ranging from uh, how and what to eat at the top here, through to migratory patterns and mate choice and fear responses. In fact, uh, Alex Thornton gave you an example a few lectures back of predator recognition in blackbirds where fear responses can be formed from observing the reaction of other birds. So I put the lower here too in question marks because the evidence that social learning is involved in uh, shaping social behaviour or in nesting behaviour is relatively scarce. But even in nest building, which was traditionally thought to be an entirely genetically encoded behaviour, there is recent evidence that zebra finches in the lab will copy the choice of nest material of their neighbours. So watch this space in the next few years, we might be starting to revise some of our assumptions about this behaviour. But here in this lecture, I'm going to focus on three contexts, song and calls, uh, foraging skills and movement. But before I get started, I want to broadly emphasize that we don't expect social learning to occur in all these contexts, in all species, all of the time. Rather, whether a species has evolved to use social learning in these different contexts will depend on their 
life history and the trade-off between the costs and benefits of acquiring behavior through social learning, individual learning, or genetically encoded behavior. And sometimes the behavior we see is shaped by an interaction between all these three forces. Right, with that said, let's start with a passerine song. So birdsong is one of the wonders of nature. All birds produce vocalizations, but the term song has usually meant these long, complex vocalizations produced typically by male passerines, which are what we call songbirds. It's an order within the larger class of birds. And they typically produce it in the breeding season to defend territories and attract mates. This song has uh, fascinated ornithologists for decades and it's incredibly well studied. The model species for its study has been this one, actually, the zebra finch. Here you can see a visible, visual representation of the typical zebra finch song um, on what we call a sonogram, which basically shows you frequency and time of the uh, acoustic elements. And you can in fact see that the song is very complex, consisting of multiple elements uh, shown down here in the bottom, and these elements consist of multiple syllables. So the long history of research on zebra finch song has conclusively demonstrated that males learn their song from an adult male tutor, such as their neighbor or their father, and they have innate biases for particular sounds. For example, they prefer conspecific to heterospecific song, and this shapes the learning process. The learning occurs in an early sensitive period in life and in a second sensory motor period later on when the bird's own vocal output, its own song, is compared to its memory of what it heard. Lab work has even uncovered the neurobiology of this process, making it perhaps the best studied form of learning in any animal. However, surprisingly, it took until relatively recently to provide direct evidence for social learning of song in the wild. So in a study on savannah sparrows, which is uh, this little bird down here, the researchers recorded songs from one population and then they artificially manipulated them to contain new elements. Uh, and then they played them back to the focal population. So on the top here, you can see a visual representation of the song um, of the population. And then the song that they played back through the use of loudspeakers with these new elements. And you can see from the bottom here that the young of that year learned the song which contained these elements. So they matched the experimental output of the speakers. So this was really good evidence for social learning of song. But also they were able to look at uh, what was important for learning. So savannah sparrows are close-ended learners, which means they only learn to produce song during their first year, and then they use that song for the rest of their life. The researchers found that if song was broadcast both in summer, just after the birds had hatched, and in the following spring before they bred for the first time, they learned much better, as you can see on this flower plot down here, than if they'd only been exposed in summer or in spring. So here social learning is happening, but it's also interacting closely with these developmental windows. So that's some. Do we have any evidence for social learning of foraging skills? Well, yes. In captivity, the social learning of foraging skills has actually been relatively easy to demonstrate by using a two-action controlled experiment, as the previous lecturers have explained. So here's an example of a small study I did where I trained some blue tips to access food using one of these two foraging techniques. So this is piercing to access the worms. And here's the second technique, flipping up the lids. I then placed these knowledgeable birds into groups of naive individuals along with this new foraging resource. So what I found was that if the birds didn't have access to a model to copy, they didn't learn how to access the food at all, as you can see in these control conditions. But when given a model, they tended to adopt the technique that I had introduced. So if I introduced a model that knew how to pierce, the large majority of birds also 
uh, pierced the foil to get to the food and vice versa if the other technique had been introduced. So this gives evidence that they had acquired the foraging technique by copying the, the knowledgeable individual and what's more copying its foraging uh, technique. We also have evidence from the wild, most famously from tool using crows. Uh, these are New Caledonian crows that live on the island of New Caledonia and they are famous for making several tool types from sticks and pandanus strips to wiggle grubs out of trees like you can see in this picture over here. There's a really great series of studies to show that even apparently cognitively complex behaviours like tool use can be an interaction between pre genetic predisposition and learning. So even when raised in isolation, New Caledonian crows will play with and make tools. However, their development appears to be assisted by social learning from adults as birds that are exposed to knowledgeable tutors learn faster. We also have indirect evidence from the wild. So birds associate with their parents for many months during which time they appear to observe them use and make tools and also get the chance to interact with the tools that the adult crows have made and discarded. And this period of interaction is correlated with the emergence of competent and specialised tool use, as you can see down here, and the drop off of uh, less useful tool use behaviour. So it gives some suggestion that at least social learning is shaping the development of tool use, even if the tendency to use tools is uh, genetically innate in these birds. So I'll return to this example later in the lecture, but I now want to turn to uh, what I've sort of hinted at here, which is this vertical transmission of learning from parent to offspring. So we call this cultural inheritance or sometimes vertical transmission. What do we mean by that? Well, this is information transferred from previous generations via social learning. Professor Whiten and others have argued that information transmitted this way can be important in shaping the behavioural repertoire of individuals and even of populations or species. Birds are a fantastic model to study cultural inheritance because they have two important characteristics that allow for experiments. Firstly, they lay eggs. This means that they can be cross-fostered. That is, eggs and early stage chicks, like those ones I'm showing down here of the great tit, can be moved between nests. And this allows experimenters to create situations where parents are raising unrelated young. And this breaks the link between genetic uh, relatedness and genetic similarity between parent and offspring and their similarity of experience. Second, many birds exhibit imprinting where they fixate on the parent that they first observed after hatching. And this means they can be hand reared. As you can see in this famous example of Conrad Lorenz acting as the father to broods of geese. So let's first turn to cross fostering. In the 1960s, Norton Griffiths noticed that Eurasian oyster catchers tended to exhibit two different techniques when they opened mussels. They carried them to hard surfaces and then hammered them open, and he called these the hammerers, or they stabbed at a weak point in the shell and then followed a series of actions to prise them open. And birds were consistent in their technique and they actually didn't show much overlap. They were either hammerers or they were stabbers. Even more intriguingly, their young adopted the same technique as their parents did. And this led him to hypothesize that they had socially learned the technique by following their parents when they were foraging and observing them. But how do you test that this is the mechanism and not genetic variation? We could equally hypothesize that uh, birds vary in their bill length and that some bill lengths, for example, longer bills are better at stabbing than they are at hammering and that they pass on this bill length characteristic to their offspring, creating a tendency in their offspring to also prefer the same technique. So how do we disentangle these? Well, Norton Griffiths performed an early cross-fostering experiment where he swapped eggs between nests. His sample sizes were low, but the results are convincing. The swapped young, here 
um, shown on this column, followed the specialization of their foster parents and not of their genetic parents. And they retained the specialization for those that you could follow into the second year of their life when they're fully independent. So this is suggestive that foraging techniques in this species are culturally inherited. Let's now move on to imprinting. So imprinting experiments have been used to study behavior for many decades, most famously by Conrad Lawrence, as I showed there. However, the example I want to give you actually comes from conservation, from the captive breeding and release of endangered cranes like this whooping crane. So initial reintroductions of young cranes that had been hand reared had really low success. In one study in 1979, none of the 14 hand reared cranes survived over four months. And this appeared to be due to tameness and an inability to forage adequately and a lack of association with wild cranes. They weren't moving and integrating into the wild flocks. In addition to this, it was soon discovered that hand-reared cranes didn't show full migratory behavior. They didn't appear to know where to go when they needed to leave the summer areas and move to their wintering grounds. So the first of these problems was solved through the use of crane costumes to imprint young birds onto something that looked like a crane. And this really improved their ability to reintegrate into the wild flocks. And then the second problem in one of the great conservation success stories was overcome by imprinting young cranes onto microlite aircraft, like this one shown here, which then guided young cranes on their first migration, effectively teaching them uh, the way to go. In a study by Muller et al, they looked at several generations of re-released cranes and they mapped their migratory pathways, as you can see here, uh, from Florida up and towards the north of the US and into Canada. So the first migration of all the birds was done with an ultralight aircraft. But for the birds' subsequent migration, they found evidence of social learning. So when young birds migrated with older individuals, they navigated a more efficient and straight path, here shown in figure B with the blue path versus the red path. And this suggested that older individuals were an important source of knowledge. They also, of course, had really good records on all of these birds. And so they were able to look at what a genetic component migratory efficiency showed. And they actually found no uh, clear genetic link between migration behavior and, uh, and genes, suggesting that social learning was the most important factor determining migration success in this species. So the last example I want to give you combines both of these experimental techniques by cross-fostering young between species. So blue tits here at the top, great tits and pied flycatchers all nest in similar sites and at similar times. And so in a series of studies, Professor Slatsvold took example of this, uh, took advantage of this, excuse me, to move young between nests of different species. So here you can see a clutch of two young birds and they're from the same nest, but one is a great tit and one is a blue tit. And these birds will be either getting raised by a blue tit parent or a great tit parent. Because of imprinting, a great tit like this one raised as a blue tit would think it was a blue tit and vice versa. They then uh, spend their time foraging with the species that they think they are. By tracking the birds throughout their life, the researchers found long lasting and multiple effects of this cross fostering on their behavior. So these include mate choice, song, foraging behavior, but I'll show you two examples. So first here in figure B, you can see the original song of a blue tit and a great tit and the song of the cross-fostered individual. Here is a cross-fostered great tit and a cross-fostered blue tit. And you can clearly see that they're attempting to sing the song of their adopted species 
rather than their genetic species. In addition to this, cross-fostered individuals foraged in the microhabitat preferred by their adopted species, here demonstrated by canopy height of foraging. And you can clearly see that great tits forage low, lower than uh, blue tits naturally do, but cross-fostered great tits forage more like at the height of that blue tits would be expected to. And finally, they even feed their own young on the prey type preferred by their adopted species, here shown on figure D. So there appears to be social learning involved in multiple aspects of the foraging niche and song of this species, of both of these species. Social learning of foraging behaviour in blue tits and great tits may be particularly facilitated by their winter ecology as the juveniles, when they become independent from their parents, join adult flocks in which they could well acquire a range of behaviour. And I'll come back to this later in the lecture. So let's move to the next section where we look for wild cultures in birds. So we've seen that many, if not all birds, can and do exhibit some social learning across various contexts that include learning about communication, how to eat, where to migrate. We've also seen that there's evidence in some bird species that they culturally inherit uh, parts of their foraging behaviour from either their parents or older individuals in the population. However, how much of different aspects of behaviour will be socially learned and culturally inherited will again depend on the costs and benefits of social learning versus individual learning or genetic inheritance, as was discussed in previous lectures and is here so well illustrated by the example of the New Caledonian crow, where tool use behaviour actually appears to be shaped by a mix of these three processes. We've also seen that birds are an excellent group for experimental work, and much of our evidence for social learning comes from experiments. However, what evidence do we have for the existence of wild cultures, as so clearly shown in primates, where socially learned behaviours have been shown to be specific to certain groups or populations. For example, in the case of Professor White and his colleagues' seminal work on chimpanzees, where the behavioural repertoire varied across populations in Africa. Well, perhaps not a lot, except for in one context where we have an awful lot, vocalisations. In the example I gave before, the evidence showed that savannah sparrows learned from their fathers and their father's neighbours and their neighbours the following spring, the latter two here mimicked by uh, the loudspeakers. And many studies from the laboratory echo these findings that vocalisations are socially learned as well as shaped by inherent preferences. There's also evidence from other studies that female songbirds prefer males that sound like their fathers. And you can see that if you combine these two factors with some error rate in copying or drift where neutral changes occur over time in trait frequencies, then isolated populations may diverge over time and develop very distinct song types. In fact, that's exactly what we see. There's so many examples of dialects in passerin song that I cannot list them here, but I will give you one classic case study uh, for, from the white-crowned sparrow. So this is this little bird shown down here with its white crown. And uh, on the next figure, what I'm showing you is the song types recorded up and down the coast, uh, the Pacific Northwest coast of America. In this species, every male sings an individual distinct song, but the songs are clearly clustered in, by location. You can see here with these different song types denoted by different numbers, and the clustering of numbers as you go up and down the coast. There's also some suggestion that the vocal cultures are maintained by males choosing to sing the song that is most locally common. So in a follow-up study to this, Douglas Nelson found that males practiced a process of selective attrition. So that is, males memorize a variety of songs in their hatching year summer, 
and then they overproduce these songs upon arrival the next spring in their breeding grounds and then they selectively retain the one type that matches the local song culture that they're hearing around them. So continuing on this sparrow theme, more recently Professor Lachlan recorded song repertoires from the Swamp Sparrow. And I wouldn't blame you if you're struggling to see the difference between these species, but trust me, they are. So he recorded repertoires from across the range of the species and then compared syllable frequencies to the output of individual computer simulations. And they found that syllables were learned with an estimated error rate of about 2%, but with a conformist bias, bias in learning. And what they meant by this, um, as similar to the white crown sparrows, that there was a bias with a simple mechanism of overproduction and then selective attrition to the most locally common behavior. But the result of this was highly stable local cultures maintained over time, even with this error and even with movement between sites. In fact, their model estimated that syllable types could perhaps persist for more than 500 years. What about other kinds of vocalizations? Well, to look at this, we can turn to parrots. Parrots don't have song, but they are lifelong vocal learners and are highly social. Many species show this communal roosting behavior where larger populations sleep together in these loud, noisy roosts where they're all communicating with each other. We can hear a variety of calls here, but the main one is in fact the contact call where they're basically shouting, hello, I'm here. Hello, I'm here too. So over many years, Professor Wright and colleagues have studied the vocalizations in the Amazon parrot in Central America. So they've identified dialects in the contact call. So this is the one a little bit more melodious, but similar to the one you just heard in cockatoos, which is a simple vocalization used by all age and sex groups in a number of social contexts to coordinate or communicate between individuals. And here on this graph, you can see the different shapes denoting the different call types that were found at each roost. And you can clearly see that they ge cluster geographically, uh, forming local cultural variation. And these dialects were stable over the 11 years measured. And what I think is particularly fascinating is that the birds in this central set of roosts, the triangle roosts, were actually bilingual. And here you can see that on the middle line of the graph, they uh, showed both call types from the north and the south. So the dialects that they studied and found are maintained despite gene flow. So genes and culture are not closely associated. And when the researchers did translocation experiments, they found that juveniles would change their vocalization to match the local calls, but not adults, interestingly. And this suggests that post-dispersal learning by the juveniles, but high philopatry by adults, explains the stability of these vocal dialects, maybe along with some sort of bias towards the local call types. I think the jury is still out on this one. So that's vocal culture. Do we ever have evidence for any other kind of cultures in birds for foraging culture or material culture? Well, we certainly have much less, but perhaps um, to look at this, let's turn back to the New Caledonian crow. As I mentioned before, there's some evidence for social learning in New Caledonian crow tool use. And New Caledonian crows actually exhibit several different types of tool use. So here you can see four types of tools that have been made from the same kind of pandanus leaf. So this one is what they call a wide straight tool, but they can also be thin straight tools. Or these two down here, which are forms of stepped tools, where you see step down in the width of the tools. And there's some suggestion that these step tools might be more efficient. So systematic surveys conducted by Hunt and Gray revealed some variation in pandanus tool shapes across the main island. 
So in most surveyed areas, crows manufacture the step tool type, but in a handful of localities, they also fashioned the wide tools or the narrow tools. The researchers suggested that the observed geographic distribution of Pandanus tool types suggested local cultures and was even perhaps the outcome of cumulative culture where across crow generations a simple tool design had uh, become progressively refined to create these more complex step tools. Like many studies that have used the ethnographic method to identify cultures, these results have been controversial with recent suggestions that there may be environmental variation across the island correlated with these tool types that needs to be accounted for. And so this leads to my final section. So here we can try and use changing environments and the spread of new behaviours to overcome this problem of inferring cultures from observation. So for many animals, the environments they live in no longer resemble those that we might think they evolved in, but rather have been modified by the actions of humans, producing novel challenges and opportunities. And this is a topic I'll return to in more depth in my later lecture on ecology and culture. However, one way to identify cultures then might be with perturbations in the system. So that is, environmental change can lead to the innovation and spread of new adaptive behaviour, which can potentially then establish it as a new culture. Or cultures themselves may change in response to changing conditions, uh, what we call cultural evolution. I'll first give you a couple of examples of potentially naturally occurring innovations and new cultures in birds. And then I'll show you some experimental work using the spread of innovation to look at social learning and culture. So the classic example of the spread of innovation is this one. In 1921, great tits and blue tits started to pierce the tops of milk bottles that were left on doorsteps in the UK and uh, steal the cream from them. In an early case of citizen science, Fisher and Hind asked for members of the public to send in reports of this behaviour and they actually followed it over the next 30 years until milk bottle design, cha uh, design changed and it largely died out. In a later analysis of this work by Professor Lefebvre, he was able to show that the behaviour in the UK appeared to have two distinct origins here shown he won by one in the south and a second in the north of the country. And over time, it appeared to have spread geographically away from these points and also showed a cumulative uptake in the population, as you can see on this top graph. So this is the most famous example of a innovation and spread of innovation, but it's certainly not the only one in birds. More recent examples include bat eating in tits. So in a cave in Hungary, the birds started to eat an entirely new prey, which was hibernating bats. They would kill them as they slept in winter and eat their brains, which is a bit gruesome, but very interesting. And uh, we also have examples from other species. For example, in uh, gulls in South America and Argentina, over the last 30 years in one bay, they started to steal or eat blubber and skin from the back of whales that are surfacing. These are southern right whales with their calves that they bring to these bays. And they've, this behavior appears to have shown a very strong increase locally over time and has even uh, resulted in consequences for the whales. So the local whales are more stressed they surface less to try and avoid the gulls, and they've even changed the way that they surface to try and expose less of their backs to the gulls that are uh, come to peck on them. And um, another interesting case is one tied to the urban environment. So in two parrot species, the kia and the sulfur-crested cockatoo, they appear to have independently innovated bin opening behaviour where they open household bins to steal household rubbish like bread. 
My research group is currently working on understanding this lower innovation, but uh, so I can't talk too much about that, but I can tell you a little bit more about the Kia example. So I think what was really interesting about this one is that it started but then didn't spread beyond a few individuals. And the researchers suggested that this might be because it was cognitively difficult for the birds and also physically difficult. So the balance uh, was weighted in favour against um, bothering to learn and practice this behaviour. There just wasn't enough reward in it. And this makes a really important point that we wouldn't always expect innovations to spread. However, if they do, we could perhaps uh, hypothesize that the pathway might look something like this. We have a novel challenge or opportunity, so if we take the milk bottle example, this would be cream. An innovation in behavior on the part of some number of individuals in the population, and then social learning by others leading to the transmission of this innovation more widely across the population eventuating with a persistent group level change that we could call animal culture or a new tradition. So in my work, I wanted to test the, this pathway and how realistic it was. And so to do that, I went back to this same species, the great tip. And I worked in a population where all of the birds were microchipped. This is the same sort of microchip you put on your cat or dog but it allows us to uh, remotely track them when they come to RFID antenna. And it also allows us to put internal electronics in this RFID antenna and interact with the birds based on their pit tags. So I performed a classic two action and control experiment to test whether innovation could lead to social learning. So here I caught birds from different subpopulations around the larger population and I brought them into captivity and I trained them on uh, one of two options. So in option A, they pushed this bi-directional door to the right to get to the worms behind it. In option B, they were trained to push the same door to the left. And in the control group, they weren't given any training. So this is to test for the underlying rate of asocial learning. I had another piece of evidence that I could put into this picture as well, and that was the social networks. So what I mean by this is that we had a good understanding of the population structure of this woodlands. And we did this by basically recording whenever two birds foraged together. And over time, in many thousands of observations, you can build up uh, an understanding of their uh, social behavior and their social connections. So here you can see a map of the social network superimposed on the woodland and every dot is a single bird and the line between two dots is the proportion of time those two birds spent foraging together. And the color in this case is a uh, clustering algorithm, algorithm that identifies the different social communities within the wider population. So I introduced my innovations into these different social communities. What should I find? Well, from a small number of individuals trained to solve this behavior in captivity and then released into the wild, I observed hundreds of individuals solving this new resource to get a worm and the vast majority of whom were doing so using the same technique that I had originally introduced. And this is despite the fact that every door was equally solvable using an equally difficult, equally rewarding alternative. In addition to this, I could see the information moving through the social network. So here the birds are turning red in the order at which they learn. And hopefully what's really obvious is that social ties were really important to the order in which birds learn. So you can see the pathway of information as it moves through the population. About 80% of each population learned and they were very strongly biased towards the behavior I'd originally introduced. So if I had introduced variant A, the vast majority of birds and of souls were of variant A as well. So this was good evidence for the formation of local traditions, 
but we also had evidence that these persisted over generations. So I put out puzzle boxes over three generations of birds. They live on average two years, so this is three years in real time. And I recorded uh, what the behaviour was over this time. So here I'm showing you one example of uh, subpopulation T3 in the first year, second year and third year. And you can see that the preference for variant B persists strongly over multiple generations long after the original innovator has died. So it suggests that a single or a small number of innovators is sufficient to establish a persistent arbitrary behaviour performed by the majority and transmitted to the next generation. That is, the spread of innovation can lead to culture. So this work doesn't demonstrate that tits have culture, however it does show they have the capacity for culture, and that the spread of innovation is a realistic mechanism by which new cultural traditions could be established in wild populations. Now we don't have any equivalent studies on vocal learning. However, we do have some which start with a baseline of acoustic isolation to show a similar sort of result. So in this work on zebra finches in captivity, isolates were created by rearing individuals in complete silence. So these birds have never heard another bird sing when they started to produce their own song. And they did produce song, but the, with song which, with characteristics that differed wildly from the wild type song. So here you can see down the bottom two isolate songs and two uh, more natural zebra finch songs. And the isolate songs have these long babbling nonsense sequence. So the researchers took these isolate birds and started new colonies with them. So the colony founder here in red is the isolate and over uh, successive generations you can see uh, it becomes darker green. And then the purple blobs here are what we would expect from a more wild type song. And what you can see is that over time, songs evolved towards wild type songs. So it appeared that the song culture could uh, emerge from a baseline of very little. And what's more, these changes were cumulative. So uh, multiple new elements were being added and then refined over time to produce a more complex and structured song. So that's in the lab, how about in the wild? Well, the last example I wanna show you is that from a really interesting natural experiment, that of translocations. So it does appear that over time, song can change in wild birds. And these can be driven by processes like drift, founder effects, population bottlenecks, uh, and the like leading to a diversification or a divergence of song types. So in this example, saddlebacks, which are an endangered New Zealand bird, were uh, introduced from mainland populations to predator-free islands off the coast. And they were done, this was done multiple times, and so that you can see over, you can track uh, populations which vary from being very recent to being almost 40 years old to the main mountain population, which is obviously much older. And what the researchers found is that with the initial introductions, the song lost a lot of diversity and variability, suggested that it had gone through a bottleneck. But then over time, it regained uh, both diversity and um, variability. So here, these are the most recent populations and over time they become more diverse. So they suggest a gradual regaining of uh, song elements over time, but most interestingly, they became more distinct from the main population in this process. So this suggests that uh, they were changed, the cultures were changing on these different islands and becoming distinct from each other through this process. There's also fantastic examples of 
uh, invasive dynamics leading to change in song and island colonization leading to change in song in chaffinches. So if you're interested in understanding this in more detail, then uh, I really suggest you look at some of that literature. So I want to finish by saying that I hope I've shown you some of the diversity of understanding that we have of social learning, culture, spread of innovation and cultural evolution in birds. And I want to particularly emphasize that experiments have been really important in demonstrating that social learning and culture is occurring in birds and also really helping our understanding the mechanism of how this is happening. And in fact, birds probably have been most important or have played the most important role as an experimental system that allows us to test hypotheses that have arisen out of the decades of animal culture research. So I put up some suggested reading here. Please do have a look at it if you're interested in what I've been talking about. I've tried to give you a range of uh, uh, or wide coverage of the topics with this reading. But if you're interested in one or another of the subsets of these topics, then please do take a deep dive into the literature. There's um, a wealth of material for you to look at. And with that, I want to say thank you for joining me for this lecture. I hope you found it interesting and I hope you enjoyed the entire lecture series. Goodbye.